Our guest is Dr. Montgomery McFate, who is presently uh, the, uh, holding the Minerva Chair of Strategic Research at the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, the issue that she talks about is going to revolve in large degree about the work she did uh, as a consultant for the military during parts of the Iran and Iraq, con the conflicts in Iran and, and Iraq. But the complexity of warfare, the work that we do now, getting involved in the conflicts that don't have a clear beginning and a clear end, require our forces to work very closely with the people in the country that they're there. And it's a skill set that is not, has not normally been a part of military training. Uh, Dr. McFaith was a, a part of the effort to change that, and that's part of what she's going to talk about uh, here this morning. Uh, but she'll also have the opportunity to answer questions that you have, and so during her talk, I encourage you to, uh, to think of questions from the student's perspective, and I know that we've also got some faculty here, so, so please engage with her after her talk. Uh, she is a cultural anthropologist and a defense and national security analyst. She was formerly science advisor to the United States Army's Human Terrain System Program and has held the Minerva Chair in Strategic Research at the Naval War College since 2011. She studied anthropology at UC Berkeley and did her graduate work at Yale University, uh, developing an interest in conflict studies and the culture of insurgent groups. She did a doctoral dissertation on Irish Republican social networks and cultural narratives and the role that these played in maintaining the Irish Republican Army's insurgency. Uh, as part of this process, she spent several years living among IRA supporters and then lab later working with the British uh, counterinsurgency forces. After earning her PhD in anthropology in 1994 from Yale, she went on <coughs> to study law at Harvard Law School and earned a Juris Doctor degree from Harvard in 1997. Uh, she has worked not just for the Army and at the Naval War College, but also as a defense consultant for the RAND Corporation, the Office of Naval Research, and the United States Institute for Peace. We're very privileged to have somebody of this stature come to spend uh, the day with us here. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Montgomery McFaith. Thanks, Jim. Well, hello. and. Uh, Thank you all for coming today. It's a pleasure to be here. I've enjoyed my trip uh, quite a bit so far. And um, I've discovered that actually Ohio has really marvelous candy uh, called Buckeyes and that people are very competitive about their grandma's recipe. Uh, and in fact, the grandmas are always competing to find the best one. So I've actually visited a number of candy stores. And if any of you would like to contribute to my um, culinary journey in Ohio, <laughs> Please, uh, please do. So uh, just the standard disclaimer before I start talking. Um, the opinions and ideas that I'm going to express are my own. They do not represent the position of the US Navy, the Naval War College, or the United States government in general. So I don't know if you can see that or not. It's, uh, it says anthropologists, anthropologists at the bottom, and of course they're hiding all their technology. Uh, I was asked to, and I wanted to ask, how many anthropologists are in the room? Any, any anthro majors here? Okay, are you guys mostly, uh, raise your hand if you're doing national security? <coughs> Intel, okay, law enforcement. So a lot of people from these domains, okay. So I was asked to discuss um, why cross-cultural knowledge and understanding is important within national security broadly. And then I was asked to discuss the controversy surrounding the idea of having cultural anthropologists work directly with the military in deployed environments. Um, so in, answer, in order to answer that first question, uh, you really have to understand something about the broader contexts of the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. So that's what I'm gonna talk about first is just simply the context and try to address the question of why did cultural knowledge become so important? And when I say cultural knowledge, I mean understanding people who are very different from us, who maybe have a different political system, a different legal system, a different religion, a different social structure. Um, it's a broad concept and that's what I'm talking about. So 
I think the first reason that culture became very important in, uh, in the Pentagon and in the military, starting in about 2003, is that um, when our forces went into uh, Iraq, everybody assumed that it would be a very quick fight and that we would just uh, take out Saddam Hussein and that the Iraqi um, bureaucrats and business leaders and everybody would just stay in place. We didn't realize that basically the whole society would fall apart. So what happened is that there was a shift from major combat operations to what in DC is called stability operations. Um, and so in Iraq in May 2003, neither the Department of State uh, nor any other agencies of the U.S. federal government were able to engage in quote-unquote nation building. We simply didn't have the capacity, we didn't have the training, we didn't have the money, and we didn't have the personnel. Um, so all of these tasks fell to the U.S. military. So in effect, um, the Department of Defense assumed a lot of the responsibilities in Iraq that you would you know, looking at it from the outside, just as a citizen, would assume that the State Department would do, or the Department of Agriculture. What am I talking about? I'm talking about setting up a local banking system, um, immunizing children, setting up a working legal system, and in this case, deworming sheep, right? That's what they're doing. <laughs> this is a, you know, this is a vet cap. These are U.S. soldiers, and it was their job to deworm these sheep. So that is not something you would naturally assume that uniformed military personnel would be doing, but that is in fact what they were doing. Uh, so my point is that to do all of these tasks, um, if you're gonna set up a banking system, you're gonna set up a legal system, you're gonna try to put a country back on its feet, you can't come in with your Western models of what law looks like or what a political system looks like. You have to work with the people who actually live there because after all, it's their country and you're gonna leave and they're gonna stay and that system has to work for them. And if you wanna do that, you have to understand something about them. You need to understand their society, their culture, their economy, et cetera, et cetera. So the second contextual reasoning, reason about why this became important is that we just didn't have it. Basically, there was a, a real lack of knowledge about Iraq from the completely tactical to the completely strategic policy level in the United States government. And um, I was in a very rare and unusual position because I worked uh, as a civilian for the Navy and for the Army and I knew I'd worked for a Marine Corps general. I knew a lot of people in DC and I was able to talk to people. It was kind of an interesting time and I was an unusual person because I was an anthropologist and there were not very many anthropologists working in Department of Defense. So I at one point went to go talk to a National Security Council um, staffer and this is in two, 2005 and uh, I was interviewing him for some, for some reason. I was writing down what he was saying and he said, quote, nobody could tell the three-star commander of Fifth Corps what the people in Baghdad cared about. Nobody could tell him what the psyche of the Iraqis would like, were like. And can you imagine going in to conquer a country and really not knowing anything about it? Um, and this was true at the lowest level too. So this is an email that I received in 2006 from a platoon leader uh, in the 101st Airborne Division. He wrote, I am very confused about the tribal relations in this AO area of operations and how they interact. You would think that we have this down by now, but the MI, military intelligence community, isn't getting the info down to the user. So here's you know, somebody at the National Security Council and a platoon commander <laughs> both saying exactly the same thing, which is, what's going on here? What does it mean? Tell me, tell me how this society works. So <clears throat> I think the third piece is that um, people in uniform recognize that there were consequences to not having this knowledge when they needed it. Um, and some things, you know, you don't realize you need until it's too late. And I think that this was one of them. Um, so in Iraq, there were a lot of problems with misunderstanding local tribal, ethnic, religious structures. There were a lot of lost opportunities because we were talking to the wrong people. We were trying to negotiate and bargain with people who had the wrong kind of power. 
Um, we alienated a lot of potential allies who would have been happy to work with us within these countries. And we gave them a reason to support the insurgency because we were doing stuff that was basically dumb. Um, and that makes people angry and it causes casualties. So I'm going to give you just one example. This is um, from a US Army Special Forces guy uh, in Iraq um, who is now retired, living in Florida happily. He said, uh, had we understood the cultural role of celebratory gunfire. OK, do you know what celebratory gunfire is? It means at a wedding or a birthday or some important event, a bunch of Iraqis run outside and shoot their weapons into the air. And everybody, it's like how they party. It's a really um, exciting thing. And it's a sign of great happiness. It's something you do at a celebration. So he wrote, how do we understood the cultural role of celebratory gunfire? More than one wedding party would have been spared from fires conducted in self-defense against a perceived threat. So what he's saying is, we thought that those Iraqis firing weapons in the air because they were happy and excited at a marriage, we thought they were attacking us and we fired back. And that didn't have to happen. And he continued, while downrange, I tried to impress upon my crew the importance of cultural intel in the tactical environment. That knowledge enabled us to, quote unquote, retract the fangs on several occasions, allowing us to identify the behavior of potential threat groups to our ground party as benign. So in other words, what he's saying is, once we understood actually what the Iraqis were doing and what was, a per what was an actual threat and what we just thought was a threat, we were able to make better decisions about use of force. Because if you put a bunch of young men with a bunch of weapons in a foreign country and they don't know what's going on, their automatic solution is going to be fire now, ask questions later. And if you kill somebody, it's too late to ask them any questions. So, <coughs> oh, I skipped a bit. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, that was the context. I'm trying to tell you what that war felt like in 2003, between 2003 and 2007. Um, now I just want to make the case um, why this kind of information is really important in um, the military system. All the way, as I said, from uh, the purely tactical level all the way up to the strategic policy level. Um, so this guy, he's uh, that's Major Bob Holbert, who worked for me for many years. and. Um, He's an American. He's a school teacher. He teaches math in Missouri. He is a National Guardsman, and he's a Muslim. Uh, and he went down to Afghanistan, and he worked on a human terrain team. And he did an awesome job, because he really has a lot of compassion. He's used to working with people. He's very engaging, very outgoing. Um, it's people like that that we should have in uniform. Uh, so. Let's start at the strategic level. Um, I believe that good strategy starts with good anthropology. So if you understand something about the world and the people in it, you can build a better strategy, one that makes more sense. Um, and the Bush administration um, made an assumption that Iraq was a single unitary state. They were thinking about Iraq as a state. And in one sense, this was absolutely true because Iraq as a country um, did have a monopoly on violence within its border, which is sort of a poli-sci definition of a state. But in another sense, if you got below the level of the formal, formal government in Iraq, um, and you started, you know, when, when I say that, I mean the ministries, um, the police, the judiciary, etc., and you started to think about the actual social structure of the country, it would have been very clear that this is a fragmentary society, um, extremely disunified. There were divisions between the ethnic groups in Iraq. So you had Kurds, you had Turkmen, you had Yazidi, you had Arabs. Between religious groups, such as Shia, Sunni, Jewish, and Christian, there's a lot of religious diversity in Iraq. Between really powerful tribal groups, such as the Dulemi and the Shamar, who have had conflict for centuries. Um, and these divisions existed both at the center, right, and Baghdad, and um, in the periphery. And <clears throat> moreover, a lot of 
power under Saddam Hussein and a lot of resources stayed in Baghdad and didn't flow out to the provinces. So there was already kind of a tension there between the urban and the rural. Um, and so assuming that Iraq was a single unitary state in the way we think of the United States, Mexico, Sweden, uh, was bad anthropology. Um, and I, I do admire Condoleezza Rice because she um, publicly acknowledged the mistake. In 2010, she said, quote, we didn't understand how broken Iraq was as a society and we tried to rebuild Iraq from Baghdad out and we really should have built Iraq from the outside in. All right? Start in the provinces and then go to the center. So it was an interesting acknowledgement to hear her say we could have done a better job in knowing how the system worked and then that would have enabled us to do our jobs better. Um, and you know, think about this. If we as a country had a going in a plan and a strategy in place that accounted for um, how Iraqis perceive the world, how their justice system works, how their social structure is organized, what would we have done differently? And I think the answer is we would have done a lot differently. So at the operational level, um, cultural knowledge is also very important. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a story. This is a true story. It happened to somebody who worked for me. And he's a, he's a PhD anthropologist. Um, spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. He wrote a dissertation about um, mountain tribes. And he deployed with us as part of a human train team. And so in 2008, in Paktika province, uh, U.S. forces in this one particular unit, which will remain nameless, uh, were shooting heavy ammunition into a pine forest for target practice. And they were thinking that this area was a dangerous area, that it was full of insurgents. Um, because they were seeing all these people out there moving in the trees. And so what the military didn't know was that during the month of September, entire families head into the mountains um, and they stay out there for several nights at a time, and they are not insurgents. They were collecting pine cones. Uh, so for the villagers, for these people, the Zadran tribe, pine nuts are their main economic mainstay, right? Um, basically, here they are with the pine cones. What they're doing is they're picking out the seeds. They bag them up and they send them out of the country. It's an export of Afghanistan. It's a very lucrative thing to do, a lucrative way to make money. Um, so this explains why these people were so totally, completely angry um, at the artillery being fired into their pine forests. Um, because the Americans might have well just come and burned their crops. It was the equivalent. Um, and so the point here is that because these camps, you know, these people camping out in the forests, look like insurgents, the danger is that the military would mistake these Zadran pine nut gatherers for an insurgent group and shoot them completely unintentionally. Um, and so what this guy did, uh, who was on a team there, he went out and he talked to the Zadran people. He wanted to know why they were so angry. And so they told him the story about the pine nuts and why they were so pissed at American forces, um, you know, and why there was more insurgent activity in this area was because the, these people were happier to side with the insurgency who at least weren't burning their, <laughs> you know, shooting artillery into their trees than they were to support, you know, the coalition. So um, he went back to the commander of this unit and uh, he briefed the brigade commander and that brigade commander said, okay, I've got it. And he then in turn briefed all of the um, pilots and subordinate units that this was pine nut season and they should be especially cautious not to mistake pine nut gathering parties for insurgents. So that's a very simple example, but it demonstrates a really important point. So if you don't know anything about the local society, you may mistake pine nut gatherers for insurgents and the people you kill are gonna be innocent. And that is the wrong thing to do on a moral level. So I'm gonna tell you a, a tactical thing right now. Um, you know, I have 
spent many years talking to military personnel about their experiences, particularly ground forces, so um, special forces, army soldiers, marines, uh, and one of the things that all of them talked about as being extremely distressing and uh, potentially, you know, making them feel like they were in a hostile environment mm, is this use of vehement hand gestures. Look at how angry she is, right? My friend took this picture in Baghdad and that's something, that's how the Iraqis are. They get right up in your face and they yell at you. Um, and they also tend to move in your peripheral vision a lot, so they won't actually approach you directly, they'll approach you from the side, which can be very frightening. If you think someone, if you think you're under threat and somebody's approaching you from the side and you can't really see them, that can be very frightening. And also they like physical closeness, right? So Americans, if I get, you know, within two feet of you, you're gonna take a step backwards because you're uncomfortable having somebody that close. Iraqis are not like that. Like, look how they're all, <laughs> they're standing like cheek to jowl with that guy. And that is a very frightening thing. And if you don't understand that, if you don't understand that's how Iraqis are, you might mistake this for real hostility. It's not real hostility. They're just telling him their problems. <laughs> so that's the strategic, operational, and tactical importance. And, um, and also the context for why sociocultural knowledge became so important to the DOD. And I want to turn now and talk about why this was so objectionable to the anthropologists. Have you, any of you ever read about this, heard about it, thought about it, show of hands, just any familiarity with this particular issue? Okay, good. So at least one person here reads the New York Times. That's great. <laughs> you should all subscribe. All right. So, um, okay. So a bunch of us in the Pentagon recognized that there was a huge problem in 2003, that the military was being sent down range and all these problems that I just told you were happening. And the question was, what do we do about this, right? We have to do something. And so the military's first impulse is always to train the forces, um, which they did. They started actually, you know, they're very innovative and they started immediately trying to train people going down range. Um, but that wasn't actually enough because there was very little knowledge available about what Iraq was like or what Afghanistan was like because both of these countries had basically been living under totalitarian dictatorships and nobody had been in there to conduct research since about 1967. So all the knowledge that was possessed, not all of it, there were some exceptions, but most of the knowledge that we had was completely outdated and it was also very focused on you know, particular provinces or, um, you know, the history of these places. And actually with the, these brigade commanders who were in charge of these large military units, they wanted really granular information, not about what was going on in Baghdad, but what was going on in Mosul. How did the tribal system work in Mosul? What was the economy there like? How did it work? Um, so we thought, you know, the best way to approach this is to design an organization that can conduct research on the ground in that place where that military unit is and then is standing there, you know, in the tactical operations center and can brief the commander. So when he says, you know, why are these villagers so angry? There's somebody there who has talked to those villagers and can explain to that brigade commander why these people are pissed and can offer him some potential solutions to the problem. And so we put together a program. We started with uh, a good idea on PowerPoint. We made PowerPoint slides. We had no budget, we had no money, but we had a conspiracy of about five people. <laughs> and, um, and we, you know, we basically just sold the idea to anybody who would listen. It was very entrepreneurial, which is something that doesn't happen a lot inside of the Department of Defense where people get a new idea and then are able to actually bring it to fruition. Um, but we did, and within four years, we went from a good idea on PowerPoint to um, an institutionalized army program. We went from having a, a proof of concept experiment involving five teams to having a requirement issued by CENTCOM, Central Command, um, who were in charge of the Middle East Central Asia Theater, to put a team, a mixed military civilian team, 
a research team on every brigade, every regimental combat team, every division, and every corps headquarters in Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh, and by the way, you can also send people to work with the guys who do the training of Iraqi forces. And we'd also, we ISAF, we'd also like our own set of teams so we can send them to the Poles and the Dutch and the Germans, etc. And yes, they have to speak Polish. So it was, you know, trying to recruit Polish speaking PhD social scientists is not easy, um, especially who want to go to Afghanistan. I'm sure you can imagine how hard that was. So it basically the point of this is we built this huge program to address a shortfall and we did it in the middle of a war. And that, that in itself is an interesting story. And that's, that's kind of the background about what we were doing and why we were doing it. And then, and then in 2005, not surprisingly, the American Anthropological Association, which is the big professional society for anthropologists in the United States, um, declared that uh, this program, the human terrain system, was an unacceptable use of anthropology. Those were their actual words. And um, another smaller group uh, put out a pledge that people could sign that said, I will not work for the government downrange. Um, and they basically, it was basically a boycott. Um, and so why? Why were they so mad? I mean, it's a kind of common sense idea that if you're going to send soldiers and marines downrange and try to rebuild a country, you might want to know something about it. Well, so in the AAA, uh, the American Anthropological Association Code of Ethics, anthropologists must do everything in their power, I'm quoting, uh, everything in their power to ensure that the research does not harm the safety, dignity, or privacy of the people with whom they work, conduct research, or perform other professional activities. So this is an interesting thing because it, it's unlike the professional ethical code of most other social sciences. It's actually closest, if you go back and read all these things, which I did, um, it's the closest thing to the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take, this idea of do no harm. And it kind of trumps everything else for anthropologists. Um, so for them, this is kind of an ethical tenant, and it's also like a sacred value. It's almost a religious value. Um, and so, I mean, one of the conclusions you could draw from this is that anthropology is no longer really about science. It's not about objectivity. It's actually about protecting, representing, and helping the people that you work for in the communities where you work. And from their perspective, the government, US government, was somewhat suspicious, and the military was downright evil because these are a bunch of big guys with guns, and their job is to kill people. Um, that was the perspective from a lot of anthropologists. Um, so, I mean, I could address all of these, but the one that they really kind of got really mad about um, was the idea of an informed consent. So, um, if I'm interviewing you, and you're a prisoner, you don't get to choose whether or not I'm interviewing you because you don't get the choice. Um, you don't have the ability to make informed consent. So their, their position was that if you have people in uniform or even people in civilian clothes standing with guys in uniform carrying weapons, that Afghan and Iraqi civilians um, feel threatened and uh, cannot actually have informed consent because they're terrified of you with your weapons and they are afraid of uh, if they don't consent, that you'll kill them. And that was kind of the, the fear that a lot of anthropologists had. And I mean, I, I have been in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I've been out in villages and talking to people. And for the most part, um, nobody in Iraq or Afghanistan is intimidated by somebody who has a gun. <laughs> and the reason is because everybody has a gun. Um, even you know, grandmas in Afghanistan have guns. It's just part of the culture. It's just like Texas. So the idea that they would be intimidated is kind of preposterous. Um, and all the time, if you're out there walking around and you're an American, you, whether you're holding a weapon or not, um, people will come up and mob you, like literally up in your face, because 
they think you have some kind of power or resources and you can do something to help them with their air conditioner, you know, their missing brother who was, you know, abducted, anything you can imagine, they think you can help. And so they're very eager to talk to you. Um, and if they don't come up and you're in a village and they kids don't run out to greet you and ask you for candy and pens, uh, something's going on in that village and it's not a safe environment. So uh, Iraqis and Afghans, in my, in my personal experience anyway, uh, never felt threatened by people with weapons because it was so much part of their world. Um, what I think is really interesting is actually the kind of gray areas in the ethical uh, ethical questions, right? Because this is where you see um, how different choices have different outcomes and the right choice may lead to a bad outcome and a, a bad choice may lead to a good outcome. Anyway, um, hmm. how do you balance harm and good? And let's take a concrete example. Should anthropologists civilians, American civilians, go on night raids with military units. And usually the night raids are direct action missions. They're conducted by special operations forces. So we're talking SEALs, uh, special forces, rangers, etc. Should anthropologists or any social scientist go on these missions? Um, you know, these, the idea in Iraq and Afghanistan of a night raid is highly objectionable. Um, why? Because the home is considered a sacred space and cannot be violated. Also to have strange men in your house in a society where women are confined to the home and usually don't go out in public and here come a bunch of guys with weapons at night, you know, using the night vision goggles um, and they're in your home and they're seeing your wife and maybe your daughters uh, with no burqa and you can see their hair. That's a tremendous violation, very, very bad. Um, but you know, for even if the Iraqis and the Afghans hate them, for operational reasons, these raids are gonna occur regardless because if they think somebody is a terrorist, if they have intelligence that says this guy's in, in the insurgency, they're gonna go after him, right? That's their job. Um, so should social scientists try to mitigate the negative effects, right? Um, should they accompany the military and stand there and say, look, you know, these women are not posing a threat. Put them in a different room. Um, you know, have them cover their, give them access to cover their heads. And, you know, there's a better way to do this, basically. Um, to me, that is a really interesting question um, because you're never gonna get the military to stop doing something, but you can alleviate the negative consequences. So is the ethical code really that we should do no harm ever or participate with anybody who does harm? Or should we try to make the harm less? Should we try to mitigate it? And I think that that's a really gray area um, for a lot of people who do social science type research. Um, and I don't have an answer. You know, in a way, I think, I think it's always better to engage with the military. That's kind of my, you know, my intuition because you don't get people to change what they're doing. You don't get them to think differently if you just stand there and kind of go, no, 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 no. You have to talk to people in order to get them to change what they're doing and to think differently about what they're doing. So I think engaging is the right thing, but I'm a minority in my own professional discipline. Um, so, you know, it's, this is Alpha Palace in Iraq. It was Saddam Hussein's palace. And we took it over and then it became uh, General Petraeus's palace for a while. Um, and we just gave it back about nine months ago to the Iraqi government. Um, and it's still intact. It's the gaudiest thing you've ever seen with these like huge gold chandeliers and like more marble <laughs> than you can imagine. Um, Anyway, you know, the question is, these wars are coming to an end, okay? Uh, we're still using, we're having an air campaign in Iraq right now against ISIS, and we still have forces on the ground in Afghanistan. Um, 
So what happens when these wars end? Because I can tell you that setting up a program like the human train system during the middle of a war was really hard. It's really hard to do that. It's a lot easier to build an organization and conduct this kind of research during peacetime. And so what do we do? Are, are we going to, um, are we going to maintain these programs, not just HTS, but a lot of different things that were built during the war, or are we going to let them all go away? And then what happens the next time we get into a war in a country that we don't understand, right? Then we have to do it all again. Um, and I'm planning on being retired by then, <laughs> so I don't want them calling me. That's something you guys are going to have to figure out, right? Because you're the next generation of people who want to do this kind of work. Um, and I'm just going to close by reading something from uh, Robert Gates, who is the former Secretary of Defense. He said, every time we have come to the end of a conflict, somehow we have persuaded ourselves that the nature of mankind and the nature of our world have changed on an enduring basis, and so we dismantle our military and intelligence capabilities. My hope is that we wind down in Iraq and whatever the level of our commitment in Afghanistan, that we not forget the basic nature of humankind has not changed. So with that, I end my presentation and we'll take questions. Thank you.